When I church in uh, Philadelphia, one of the things that I always looked forward to was on Easter Sunday, at the conclusion of our service, we would gather people from the congregation and we would all gather up front and sing the Hallelujah Chorus from, the, um, from Handel's Messiah. We would begin practice on Thursday, after the Monday Thursday service, we'd all gather up and, and start to, to practice. Um, and then on, on Sunday, Easter Sunday, the way we, we would conclude our service, just um, uh, glorifying God for, for the wonderful good news that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. He broke the power of sin and death. And we use this amazing gift from God, the, um, uh, the Messiah, um, and this hallelujah chorus to praise God. And, you know, we'd sing it with all the gusto we could. Um, I, I miss that celebration. That's something like I think we come to when we come to the end of the Lord's Prayer. As we've been studying, this is a model that Jesus used to teach his disciples how to pray. And I think there's so much more. I think certainly it's a wonderful thing to, when we gather together to pray the Lord's Prayer. But if that's all we do, we miss so much about the meaning and the power of this prayer and what we're doing. As we've examined in the past, over the past uh, six or seven weeks, um, this is a prayer that begins with the acknowledgement of the almighty God of the universe. Not only is he almighty God of the universe, but he's our father, our Abba, our daddy in heaven. And we're, begin, we're to begin by praying, um, acknowledging this, and then worshiping God, hallowing his name. That's this, this awe and respect we have when we begin to understand who this God is. And we hallow his name, and, and we talked about some of the names of God, and, and the names of God reflect the character and the wonderful nature of this almighty God that we worship. And then after acknowledging who God is, we pray that his will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. And then the focus changes from looking upward and worshiping God to more practical and worldly concerns and petitions. And we pray, give us this day, this very day, today, give us our daily bread. And when we do this, we're understanding that all we have and all we are is a gift from God. God is our pre provider down to the very simple daily needs that we have in life. And when we ask God for these things, we're acknowledging our dependence upon God for the basic stuff of life. Next, we admit that we're sinners. And we live among a world of sinners. We live in a broken world. We don't always obey God and put him first in our lives. Often we find ourselves not only in conflict with God, but also in conflict with one another. And as we have first received forgiveness from God, so also do we need to forgive others and so Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we talked about how that's a, that's a scary prayer. That, that can be frightening to me at, at times. And then as we studied last week, we move even deeper into the spiritual realm of life and the recognition that we are in the midst of a fierce spiritual warfare. Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or um, it, it could be it, deliver us from the evil is what it literally means. And some interpretations are Deliver us from the evil one, who, of course, is Satan. 
Well, let's, that's a, a little bit of a review, but let's look now at the last part of the Lord's Prayer. And I want us to look at Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Pull out your Bibles. If you, there's a pew Bible. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. And let's find the last part of the Lord's Prayer. The last phrase, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's look at Matthew. Let's look at verse 13. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sin. Huh. That's not how we end the Lord's Prayer and pray the Lord's Prayer, is it? It's missing in in the text. It's also missing from many of the ancient manuscripts used to interpret the Bible. What happened here? It was possibly added later by Christians who couldn't just stop at the phrase that Jesus used and um, deliver us from, from the evil, deliver us from the evil one, amen. That would be kind of hard to, you know, the disciples. What, you know, there, there's something missing here. They couldn't stop. Deliver us from evil, all men. So what did they do? They went back to the very beginning of the prayer and they hallowed God's name. Perhaps it was similar to the way that we used to celebrate our Easter uh, service in, in Philadelphia with the singing of the Hallelujah Chorus. We couldn't just stop. We just needed to look again at this awesome God who loved us and had given his son to die for us and rise for us. And so Jesus teaches us that in the Lord's Prayer that God is both able and he's willing to give us what we ask. Jesus keeps his promises. The conclusion of the Lord's Prayer teaches us that in our prayers we are called to praise God. Seeking his kingdom and his power and his glory forever and ever. Amen. And so this past week, as we've been, these past six weeks, as we've been studying this prayer, we've learned the importance of understanding God, who he is, his character and his nature and his love for us. We recognize the need for our active participation in the coming of God's kingdom from heaven down to earth and doing God's will through daily acts of love in our lives. In asking for our daily bread, we acknowledge our dependence upon God for everything. Jesus taught his disciples to ask for forgiveness And to forgive others. And then he went on to live out this teaching through his death on the cross. As Jesus was dying on the cross, he looked down at those very people who had nailed him to the cross. Those soldiers who were mocking him and gambling for his clothing. And he said, Father, Give them because they don't know what they're doing. As we have been forgiven by God, so do we need to forgive others. The giving and the receiving of forgiveness is the only conditional part of the Lord's Prayer. That's interesting and it's powerful. We learned that the Lord's Prayer is a prayer for the community of disciples. It not, it's not just A personal prayer. And so we ask for our daily bread. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins. And for the deliverance from tests and trials and temptations for all of us in the family of God. This ending is not found in the Gospel of Luke. Nor in the oldest of the manuscripts in the Gospel of Matthew. 
the ending of the Lord's Prayer is so familiar to us, but it's possibly an addition by the very early church. Though our modern Bibles, like uh, this is the NIV that I've read from, it's probably in the King James. I forgot to check and see, but it, it should be in the King James, the full uh, prayer. But it's not in more of our modern translations. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for other, forever. But it's been used in the history from the very early church. For example, in the, the Didache. The Didache is a, uh, a writing from very early, like 90 A.D. So that's just right after Jesus died in about 33 A.D. So just a few years later in the early church, in this teaching, it was a teaching about, about worship, about the Christian life. And it includes, in, the, in its section on worship, it includes the full um, Lord's Prayer that we know and, and use. So very early on in, in uh, the life of the church, in the history of the church, um, the, this full phrase of the Lord's Prayer is used. And then um, the, the words themselves that are used, they parallel a prayer of David found in 1 Chronicles 29. Listen to this prayer of David and, and see the similarities. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you. You rule over all. In your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Certainly there's nothing wrong with praying this part of the Lord's Prayer. It's theologically sound and it's biblical. And there are some manuscripts that do um, contain the Lord's Prayer. And it's been a long time tradition of the church. In the Catholic Church, I think they play, pray the shorter um, section of the, of the Lord's Prayer. But why did the early church, if it is something they added, why did they add this word of praise? According to Luke's Gospel... Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and eventually to the cross when his disciples asked him to teach him about prayer. Possibly in Jesus' mind was that somber note that as he pondered the cross, he knew that he was going to Jerusalem and he knew what was going to happen and he knew that ultimately he was going to be hanging on the cross but he willingly went toward Jerusalem and nothing would dissuade him from going but maybe that's why his focus on stopping the prayer was on the evil one resisting temptation and the work of the devil now the early church experienced not just the cross but also the victory over the cross, through the cross, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And nothing could stop the early church from spreading the good news of Jesus' victory over death, not even persecution and martyrdom. And so maybe the early church, these early Christians, just felt compelled to add a note of triumph to this beautiful prayer. The end of the Lord's Prayer parallels the beginning of it. We pray, thy kingdom come, and we affirm at the end, thine is the kingdom. We pray, thy will be done, and we confirm that God has the power to accomplish his will. Thine is the power. We pray, hallowed be thy name, and we affirm, thine is the glory. When we pray for God's kingdom to come and we state that God reigns over all, we're admitting that we are not self-sufficient. Once you've probably heard this said, someone said that, that we're to pray as if everything depends upon God. And then we're to live our lives as if everything depends upon us. 
If you don't push it too far, I think that's pretty good advice. But there are times when our self-sufficiency goes too far. There are times in our lives when we face situations that are simply overwhelming. How often do we try to do it ourselves, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, rather than turning to God and recognizing that there are times when we need His help? We were not made to rule over the world and to sustain it. And that's why we say, thine is the kingdom and not mine is the kingdom. When we try to build our our own kingdom, we will ultimately fail. Life is not about elevating us to its highest place. Rather, it's about giving honor and glory and praise to God whose kingdom we pray will fully come to earth. Each of us is a kingdom, and we choose which kingdom we will serve. God's kingdom or my kingdom? We pray, for thine is the kingdom and the power. God has the power to accomplish his will. And that power is available to us if we're willing to connect with God. There's a missionary, Herbert Jackson, and he, he tells a story how as a new missionary, you know, he went to, um, to this new uh, land and, and they, they gave him a car. Well, the problem was the car wouldn't start. And it was a standard car. Um, and so he devised this plan for the car and he got permission to ask to go to the school and ask the uh, the teacher to let the children out. And so they went out and they pushed the car to get it started. Remember the standard cars? You could push them a little bit and then pull out the clutch and and uh, the car would would start. And so he ended up using his car that way for two years. You know, he'd either park on a hill. So when he got ready, he could start rolling down the hill and let out the clutch and the car would start. Or uh, he would leave the car running if it was in a in a a short term situation where he was in and out. And I've known other people who who've done that uh, myself. And um, but uh, something happened. His family got sick and they had to leave that place and they brought the new missionary on the field. And so uh, Jackson was was talking about, you know, he's showing him the car. This is a car we have, and, and this is my plan. This, you know, it won't start. And so he began to explain what he did. And while he was explaining it, the new missionary picked up the hood of the car, and he looked around under the hood, and he said, well, this cable here is loose. And, he, you know, he tightened the cable a little bit, got back in the car, and boom, car started right up. For two years... Needless trouble had become the routine. The power was there all the time. Only a loose connection kept Jackson from putting the power to work. In a similar way, so must we be in touch with God for his power to flow through us. Worship, studying God's word, prayer, and service in Jesus' name are four links to the power of God. If those cables are loose or worse, disconnected, we may find ourselves enduring needless trouble, difficulty, or frustration. But when those connections are firm and strong, we have the power for living and for doing the will of God. We pray, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that all people sin and fall short of the glory of God. And yet thanks to Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins and giving us the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2, listen to this. As you know, We dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is our calling 
to lead a life worthy of God who calls us into his own kingdom and glory. God invites us to be participants in his glory. Have you ever noticed at times that that dogs look somewhat like their owners? Or have you ever noticed that uh, you, you see an, an elderly couple and these elderly couples that they almost look alike, they think alike, they can complete each other's sentences because they know each other so well that they seem almost um, together. Um, well, you know, as, as God is a part of our lives, day after day, week after week, month after month, Year after year, hopefully through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, through God at work in us, we begin to look and to act and to think and speak more like the living God we've been working with and walking with through the years. And so we don't pray, mine is the glory, but the focus is on God And not ourselves. The Lord's prayer closes by returning the focus to God with whom it began. And the more we focus on God in heaven, the more inspired we will be on earth. In the great house of God, Max Lucado shares the story of a sociologist. And he accompanied a group of mountain climbers on an expedition. And among other things, he observed that there was a direct correlation between the cloud cover and contentment. When there was no cloud cover and the peak was in view, the climbers were energetic and they were cooperative. But when the gray clouds covered the peak and they couldn't see the mountaintop, the mountains were sullen and selfish. And the same thing can happen to us. As long as our eyes on the majesty of God and his glory, there's a bounce in our step and a light in our eyes. But when we focus on the dirt beneath our feet, we may end up grumbling about every rock and every crevice we have to walk. And Eugene Peterson, he died recently. He was a Presbyterian. uh, But he did a paraphrase of the message. You've probably seen it, heard of it. And he closes the Lord's Prayer this way. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes. As we confess that God is in charge We admit that we are not. As we proclaim that God has power and God can do what God wants to do, we admit that we need God's power for living. And we give God all the applause and all the glory because there is no one else like God. You've heard me mention Richard Foster before, and I'd encourage you, if you haven't read anything by Richard Foster Um, pick up one of his books and and read it. If you want to grow deeper in your spiritual walk with the Lord, uh, he's, he's a master. And he wrote in his book, Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home. He writes this. The truth of the matter is, we all come to prayer with a tangled mess of motives, altruistic and selfish, merciful and hateful, loving and bitter. Frankly, this side of eternity, we will never unravel the good from the bad, the pure from the impure. But what I have come to see is that God is big enough to receive us with all our mixture. The Lord's prayer is brief. And yet, within its few words, is a depth that we can easily miss and to which we must turn to daily. It's a guide to the Christian life. 
to contentment, to freedom, and to the peace that we all need. The Lord's Prayer is a powerful prayer. It's a life-transforming prayer. And when we come to the end of that prayer, we know that God will answer us and we will be changed more and more into the image and likeness of him. So let us join together and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Amen.
hear these words from the Apostle Paul. And now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly more than all we ask or can even imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ for all generations now and forevermore. Amen. I believe, so be it. That's what amen means. It means, so be it, Lord. Amen. So be it, Lord Jesus.